Hello, everyone, and welcome to A New Direction. My name is Jay Izzo, and oh, wow, <laughs> do we have a great show for you. Uh, okay, listen, I, I want to tell you something. Money. All right, just the mention of money probably brings a million things into your head. And depending on where you are at with money, right, and your relationship, with, which, by the way, we're going to talk about today uh, on, on a variety of levels, you're probably going, I either wish I had more of it or, well, probably most of you are saying, I wish I had more of it. And then somebody would be going, oh my gosh, you know, money has been just horrible or, you know, I don't know what to do with it or I, I don't know how to get it. I, I, what do I do? I, I, and, and we're frustrated with the word money. We get so frustrated with it. I understand it. Been there, done that. I will be completely vulnerable with you all. You know, whether you're watching on DBTV or listening to us in a podcast or radio across this great country of the United States, or, or internationally, by the way, uh, we are on radio. And here's the thing. Uh, you know what? My relationship with money has never been great. In fact, it's been very difficult at times. I didn't grow up with money. And so as success has come, right, having a better relationship with money has become more and more important. This book... The Little Book of Zen Money, A Simple Path to Financial Peace of Mind by the $7 millionaire, we'll call him Michael Gilmore today, uh, is absolutely fabulous. It is going to change you. It, it certainly has changed me. And I hope you will hear, and I hope you will be very, very, pay very close attention to what Michael is saying and what the book is saying. I cannot recommend this book more. Uh, really, sit down, dig into it. And I don't mean just read it. I mean dig into it. There are 49 exercises at the end of this book. You are not going to do them in a day. Okay. <laughs> but you, you need to work, do the work and walk through them because it's going to fundamentally change what you think about money, regardless of where you're at right now with money. It is going to change what you think about money. But before we get to the book, before we get to Michael, let's do what we do every week. Right. Listen, we're four part people. We're physical, mental, emotional, spiritual people. Right. And the truth of the matter is we are never stagnant, right? If we're not growing, the truth is we're dying, right? In all these areas. If you're not doing the things that you should be doing, you are dying. <laughs> so now the question becomes, let's find a way that we can be working on ourselves. So we do this rating scale on a scale of one to 10. One, this area of my life is awful. 10, this area of my life is outstanding, right? Now, listen, whatever your number is, there's no judgment here. Michael loves that because he talks about that in the book because we don't judge, right? Because what's the point in judging, right? It doesn't make any difference, right? But what, what I want you to do is I want you to pick a, pick a number that best suits you and then go, okay, what can I do right now to change it just a little bit? Michael likes to talk about little steps. I do too because we just want to move you a little bit because once we move you a little bit, that's where we can start getting momentum, all right? So whatever your number is, we're just going to take a little step. So let's start with physically. That's easy. So if you were to evaluate yourself and getting enough exercise, eating right, drinking enough water, getting enough sleep on a scale of one to 10, five being average, how would you rate yourself? All right. So now you've got a number. Now what I want you to do is I want you to think about, okay, I'm a three, let's say. Okay. What can you do to get to a 3.25 or a 3.5? What could you change right now? Right? Something in that area you could change, Right. And you can be moving, right? The goal is to get yourself moving in that direction. Okay, so that's your first number, whatever your physical number. Second number is your mental intellectual number, right? We're, we're, we're two halves of brains, right? We're right brain, left brain. We got this right side that's creative, this left brain that's more logical, right? That thinks in numbers and logic and the right side thinks in all sorts of music and other things and is creatively working all the time, right? Don't be a couch potato and think that you can just sit there and absorb everything. You need to be an active participant in your learning and growth, right? And understanding and knowledge. Knowledge is key. Michael talks about in the book, knowledge is so key, right? And so, but we have to be an active participant in that. That means we have to do something. We have to take action with it. You know, something like reading a book can be a powerful way to grow in knowledge and understanding of what we do. So on a scale of one to 10, how would you say you're doing in the knowledge intellectual area, right? That's your second number. Third number is the emotional, and we make it really simple on the show. There's a lot to be said about emotions, uh, but emotions come from the inside. 
I didn't say that. Michael said that in his book, by the way. They, but they do. I mean, listen, I'm a psychological professional. And it, the tr truth of the matter is your emotions come from inside. They do not come from the, everything on the outside. All right. So here's, here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about it in two ways. One is emotionally. How well are you able to control your emotions under stress and pressure? And then the second piece is how well are you able to tap into and understand the emotions of other people? That might require you to have a larger emotional vocabulary because you may not have the vocabulary big enough to really truly understand the emotions of other people. You may not have the emotional vocabulary to really understand the emotions of yourself. But the truth of the matter is your emotions are under your control because it's your thinking that will alter your emotions. So on a scale of one to 10, how would you say you're doing your emotional area? Okay, that's your third number. Your fourth number is the spiritual area. And you know what? We all have a spirit. We all have a spirit that wants to connect with something. We all do, right? We all, we all want to connect with something. And by the way, we all live by faith. It's the truth. I mean, the fact of the matter is you took a sip of coffee this morning and you believed it wasn't poisoned and you drank it anyway. That's faith. You made plans for your future. That's faith. They haven't happened yet, but you believe they will happen, right? We all want to rely on something in the midst of chaos that we can have a sense of peace, a sense of joy, right? In the midst of that chaos. And that can come from variety, whether it's God or it's meditation or it's nature, whatever it may be, then it comes down to a question of how's it working for you? And do you need to do something to change it? So on a scale of one to 10, how would you evaluate your spiritual area? So those four areas uh, are like the four, the four tires in your car, right? If one of the areas is low, the car is going to veer and it's not going to be able to drive and you're going to be constantly fighting it, right? If all four tires are low, what happens? Well, you're eventually going to ruin the car over the course of time. So we want to bring our tires to the right level of height. And speaking of someone who does that so well, his name is Michael Gilmore. He's also known as the $7 millionaire, and he helps manage investments for uh, Albizia uh, Capital in Singapore and has launched the Money Awareness and Inclusion Awards, which is the MAIAs, uh, which are the Oscars for financial literacy. He has previously published two books, Happily Ever After, Financial Freedom Isn't a Fairy Tale, which was written to teach his daughter everything she needs to know about money and was published by Wiley in 2021. The Thousand Dollar Journal was written for migrant workers in Singapore and elsewhere to help them build an emergency and save uh, towards their own personal investing targets. He writes for Idler Magazine. Is it Idler? It is Idler, right? And uh, yes. under the British pseudonym, the Seven Pound Millionaire. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show. Welcome to, and I hopefully not the last time, to A New Direction, uh, Michael Gilmore. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I, I was, uh, wow, what a start. That's uh, really impressive. I, I'm, I'm still doing the arithmetic of, of adding those <laughs> four numbers together. And that was superb. What a great start. Thank you very much for having me, Jay. Oh, no, it's, it's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Michael. So uh, in your introduction of your book, uh, you, we make a, you make a comparison. You say humans are warm, money is cold. Mm. <laughs> and I love that. I really do. But help people understand what you mean when you say humans are warm, money is cold. Well, it's it's really simple idea. I mean, it is we attach emotions to to money, which money doesn't have. Money just is. It's it, it's just going to be there. Whatever you attach to it, you've attached to it. And the idea is that actually. As you, as you just said, all our, all our emotions, all our warmth, everything comes from within us. But unfortunately, because we're not taught what money is at a very young age, we learn to attach all the emotional connections that we have around us. So if someone, you know, if we've got sibling rivalry and one of them gets money, we don't. Someone that gets a thing, we don't. We attach the love that we're seeing in that to the money. And all of these things fly around. Money's not doing that to us. We're doing that to the money. It's all our perception. And that's why I wanted to start, I start the book earlier with that idea, just to get the idea of none of these emotions that we're, we're throwing at money, none of these thoughts we have about money are coming from the money. They're coming from us. And we need to make sure we have that perspective, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. I love that. And, and, and I, I, you also follow that up with money it only appears to be complicated. You say that the complicated part of money is how we confuse it with the most important things in life. 
mm-hmm. attach price tags to the best of what life has to offer, like happiness, love, contentment, a sense of achievement, self-worth, and even peace of mind. When these don't need money from us at all, they only take money yeah. from us. Help us understand that. Yeah, I mean, because when you look at the so many things that people think of money as complicated, I'll, I'll start with the, the very most simple thing. I, wait, I work in, in finance. I've worked in finance 25 years. Uh, people think money is really complicated. Now, some corners of finance are reasonably complicated. But if I pick out my calculator, I probably never do anything more complicated than hit the div- division button. <laughs> it's plus minus times divide. That's literally all I'm doing most of the time. You know, I'm not running, I, I do run enormous spreadsheets, but those only have plus minus divide in them. I'm very rarely running some huge algorithm to tell me things that I don't understand. There's not very much about money that needs to be very complicated. Mm. It's actually, most things are in there. Most things that we need to learn about money, we can learn on the basic version of a calculator. They're easy things. Mm. But humanity is just the most complex thing that we know in the universe. We are all so different. We all have such different starting points. We all have such different paths. We end up in so many different places. Humanity is the most varied thing in the world. And so that's where things get complicated around money. And when we just look at that one thing, let's just look at one emotion, joy, right? That is, is almost impossible to explain. Right? How, you know, we can identify when we experience it. We can't identify why. But we can identify when, and then we look at those whens, and we can try and repeat those whens, but it's never, almost never about actually pure money. It's probably, even if money is attached, it's probably what the money was attached to that brought the joy. And we can move that around and say, look, what are other occasions when there wasn't money attached? You might like to think, and you're know, you going to bring this up in a minute, but let's say one of our favorite things is going for a really expensive meal with my family. Was it the meal? Was it the expense? Was it the family? We can work those three things out and go, it's, it's the family, right? It was never the expense. It was never the meal. It was the family. And that's where money's actually simple. It's us that's complicated, and we need to look at that. And that's where you know, the, the word Zen for me really comes into this because it's, it's, not about medita- it's not about woo-woo meditation. It's not about forgetting everything. It's the exact opposite. It's about remembering everything. It's about looking at everything. That's what mindfulness is. Mindfulness is not running away. Mindfulness is thinking, looking at it, but not allowing those thoughts to spiral because that's running away too. It's just looking at it coldly, clearly, and saying, yeah, this is reality. Beautiful. I, there was something you said in that part where you say Zen is, is Zen only appears simple. Um, hmm. and, and you kind of you know, brushed on it. You know, the secret to lasting happiness doesn't come through more stuff but less desires. And you have this equation that I just mm. kept looking at over and over and over again, which was happiness equals get divided by want. Yeah. And, and I kept thinking about that over and over and over again going, right. Okay. So right. If, if I can decrease my want, right. Mm. And, and, and if I, and if I really don't want to get more things and de- all of a sudden I become happier. And I think you're brushing on that. Right. Am, am I getting that right? Hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, let's say let's say we have let's see how we have we want a hundred things. We get eighty things. We're eighty percent happy, right? I mean, there's still twenty things out there we want. If we get a hundred things, we want a hundred things. We're hundred percent happy. But if we're eighty, twenty, eighty, a hundred, what if we just wanted eighty? Immediately, we're hundred percent happy again. And the there's so many things that are so powerful about this. Let's let's go into one of them. Which thing are we hundred percent in control of? Are we 100% in control of the get or are we 100% in control of the want? But, you know, the universe helps us decide what we get. We can go out there and we can try as hard as we want. But the world is also trying to get those things too, right? So, but what I want is only, only I, I'm in control of that. That's the one area that I'm in control of. So that is one area where we have, let's face it, having a little bit of, of you know control over an area this is this is powerful this always makes us a little bit happier than like total you know uh, lack of control but if we drop into that number like it's based really early maths right really early, early arithmetic in school divide any number by zero right divide any number by zero and you're looking at infinity now that to me is like well what would infinite happiness be and this is where zen comes into this too right zen is probably the only 
global philosophy that talks about infinite happiness, like nirvana is infinite happiness. Well, how would you get that? You'd have to divide by zero. You'd have to divide what you want to get by zero, zero once. And even Zen talks about this. This is impossible, right? That's why all the Zen koans say that this is, they're always impossible. Sound of one hand clapping, impossible. They're always impossible. But that's the point. This is impossible to achieve, but the path towards that is much better than the path towards everything else because society keeps telling us get, 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 right? And that, but to get them, you have to want them. So you're building up the wants, you're building up the wants, you're building up the wants and never quite getting them down. If you keep taking those wants back, it changes everything. It does change everything, doesn't it? Um, I want to go into chapter one, uh, which is entitled Zen and the Art of Money Management. And mm -hmm. you have a subtitle called No Judgment. And I just want to read this. this is something you said right at the beginning. It says, you're, because I, I think when people hear this, I think it's going to take pressure. It took pressure off me. Your money problems are not your fault. I know they can feel like your fault. After all, who else is spending the money? You may want to ask, but you can't blame yourself. If you don't understand something you've never been taught, your uncertainty is understandable and no one is judging you. It's a powerful concept. I want you to drill it home for us. Yeah, it really, judgment is the most damaging thing, self-judgment, judging of other people. This is one of the world's great waste of times, um, but particularly to ourselves. Because if we tell ourselves, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. Yeah, you're right. You can't. Um, it's, if you tell yourself, I, you know, this is not my, I got here because it's my fault and I did all this. I'm a bad person. I can't do money. You're never going to be able to fix it. But the reality is you've not been taught. Like if you pull me out right now, can I speak, can I speak Mandarin Chinese? No, I can't. Why not? I've not been taught. Simple reason. Could I, if I was taught, I could probably remember the stuff from my first lesson, second lesson, third lesson. I'd be able to speak more if I did some lessons. The, the judgment, I don't judge myself harshly because I can't speak Mandarin Chinese. I just haven't been to classes. The same thing with money. You're not bad at money because you are inherently bad at money. You just haven't been taught. And if you, and if you take that approach, you are a blank sheet of paper. You can start this. And that's the most important point is a blank sheet of paper. And it's very important for, for this book because, uh, you know, you, you'll have seen it through the book. This is, it's, I, the, the little book of Zen Money is, is, the, is the title. But uh, to me, the subtitle is more important. I agree. Uh, a, simple, totally. a simple path. A simple path. Because as you're walking down a path, you know where the path is. But you can't start in the middle. If you approach a path from the middle, you just don't see it. You start at the beginning of the path. So... And you won't start the path at the beginning if you judge yourself. You'll think, oh, I should be halfway down the path. Me, you know, I know a lot already. I should be halfway down. I'm, I'm 50 years old. I can't be learning the basics. Yes, you can, because you didn't learn them before. Right. Totally agree. Um, you, you, you move on, talk about money stress, the playground, the fairy tale trove, the miseducational system. And what you do here is you, you, you rightfully... And I want you to I want you to hear me clearly. You rightfully pick on my psycho, my psychological colleagues, because we have done everything that we can do to tell people how to spend more money. <laughs> uh, we have we have entered the marketing system. We have uh, you know with Bernays and go beyond. Mm -hmm. We have we have done everything that we can to figure out ways to get people to spend more of more of their money, right? I mean, we, we really have. I mean, I get it. We, we've done it, right? But you entitled something between the fairy tale trove and then the miseducation system. Yeah. And you said, I, yeah, go ahead and talk about that. Well, I, I think we, we underdo the power of advertising if we just call it the advertising industry. <laughs> you know, we think it's just the thing between, between you know, uh, plays and the football game, right? Right. Um, but it's not, it's the, it's the football game itself. It's everything we, we, you know, we go to school for however many, you know, however many years and we sit there and we get subjects bombarded at us, you know, with the, you know, the best intentions of the world, but then the whole of our lives, we get psychological experts 
devising little snippets of things that become earworms. Uh, this is a true, true story. I was having a conversation on, online with a friend of mine, went to school with them, and we were both memorizing the taglines for commercials from the 1970s. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Yeah. That's how powerful that stuff is. Now, could I memorize as many things from my, my, my French class? Probably not, right? You know, and this, that's why this is an education system, because education is designed to, to shape the way you think and get inside your head. And that's what advertising is doing to us. And I, I'm sure you saw in there the, the Yankelevich oh, survey, right? The yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm just looking at it right now in my notes here. I'm like going, because I was about to ask you, I was like going, we get, we get between, folks, listen to this. Do you want to tell them? Because you've got it right in front of you, right? I'm sure, right? No, you've got it right in front of you. You've got it in front of you. You go. So we get between 3,000 and 5,000 marketing message a day. This was a study that uh, Yankovic did. Now, here's the thing. That study was done in 2007. Okay, is anybody doing this? Mind blown. Yeah. Yeah. So imagine this. that's 16 years ago. We were getting 3,000 to 5,000 marketing messages a day. How many think you're getting now today, people? Yeah. Whew, Michael. And, yeah. And it's because it's before this. This came along. So that's, yeah. Oh, so yeah. I didn't intend to show pictures of my daughter, but yeah, that, um, that's, that's 2008. The iPhone was invented. Right. So Facebook wasn't on the end of our hands. Uh, yeah. and Instagram wasn't at the end of our hands. So now it's just like maybe nothing we ever see is not a marketing message, right? That's how things have changed. And yet, and let's go back. Has education changed that much? Are we, are we changing the way we're doing education? Are we starting to think this stuff through? So that to me was, is like, let's set this up, right? And that's what, yeah, that's what chapter one's always about, right? Let's set this up. Yeah. Um, and it's like, we mustn't judge ourselves because our education hasn't taught us about money. But our miseducation, the thing we're not calling our education, is one of the most powerful information systems in the, in the world. And it is always telling us to get rid of money as fast as we can. His name is Michael Gilmore. He's also known as the $7 Millionaire. The book is entitled The Little Book of Zen Money. But as he said, and I agree with him, the real key to this book, it's a simple path to financial peace of mind. You're listening to him here on A New Direction. Folks, Epic Physical Therapy, my physical therapist, I think they should be yours too, by the way. Listen, you know what? Whether you're recovering from injury, surgery, suffering everyday aches and pains, maybe you're a professional athlete who just wants to get better. Listen, they're going to customize a treatment program that's designed specifically for you. So when you're ready for your epic relief, epic recovery, epic results, don't look any further. Go to epicpt.com. That's E P I C P T.com. Linda Craft Team Realtors, listen, for more than 38 years, uh, they have been he helping people transition in life. And you say, wait a minute, I thought you said they were a real estate company. Well, yeah, but think about this. Every place you've ever lived in your life has been a transition in life, right? You downsize, you upsize, you move from your apartment. It's been a transition. Well, what, what they have done for more than 38 years is help people make that transition as smoothly as possible. And they'd love to help you. Regardless of where you live in the world, the truth of the matter is they're independently owned and operated and unaffiliated with a national company, which means that they have created relationships with the best real estate professional in your area. So when you're ready to start your journey, whether it's to sell a home or buy your home, start with Linda Craft Team Realtors. That's lindacraft.com, L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T dot. And we're back here on A New Direction uh, with Michael Gilmore, the book, The Little Book of Zen Money, A Simple Path to Financial Peace of Mind. And who doesn't want some of that? Um, there's a, I, I hate to stay in chapter one because I want to move to chapter two, and I will get there, I promise. Um, but, but there is something that uh, you have a subtitle in here. You don't get what you pay for. And I want to just repeat something you said, which is so powerful. One of the most depressing but common opinions I hear when promoting saving and investing for a life free from a worry about money is people telling me that they want to enjoy their lives now and not worry about the future. And I hear it too um, all the time, especially, I don't know why it seems to be more frequent in the younger generation, but it does seem to be that way. The depressing part you say and the difference is that the people who tell you tell me this genuinely seem to believe that enjoying themselves now uh, requires spending all their money immediately. And 
uh, this became very powerful for, to me. And I just feel like you just need to speak to those people who maybe have that opinion that, you know, I want to enjoy my life now. Uh, how do we get them past that? Yeah, I, to, to me, and, and the, the, as you the, as you know, there's an exercise in the book that's, that's designed specifically for this. But before before I mention that, I, I think to me it's, it's I I heard that comment so many times, and every time I heard it, it just sounded like when they said it, it sounded like an equation. Mm. It, it's enjoyment equals money spent. Therefore, I must spend all; otherwise, I won't be enjoying. And I was like, that means money equals in money is joy which which we know is not true and we've we've already established that okay so how do i give people an exercise to to let them see that and that was why the exercise came about was like because and i did this myself anyway you know as like you know it, it let's actually give people this and this is again one of the ways we bring let's say not zen into this but mindfulness meditative practice is one of the other ways you know, it isn't just always sitting in a dark room with your eyes closed you know <laughs> a, a great meditative practice is is free writing you know, get a pen and paper out and just write stuff down. You know, it can be any form of free writing. And that's when we brought this in and said, okay, what if the prompt is, what were my 10 happiest times? Or just as many happy times as you can write in a minute. Let's just go. Uh, and I do this, uh, you know, I do this myself. I love doing this, in fact, because sometimes, you know, the, the nature of free writing is an occasion that will pop into your mind you hadn't ever thought about before as being, that was a great time. Because, you know, we can all write so, three or four things pretty quickly. But getting towards 10 is like, oh, come on, come on, come on, think something new thing. And your mind starts firing and you start thinking new things. But if you write out those 10 happiest times, normally you can look at that pretty quickly and say, oh, those aren't all money related. But you know, if you don't jump to that step immediately, then a, an immediate follow-up step is to sit down and write, what were my 10 most expensive times? And my 10 most expensive times, just go back and, okay, what about, you know, what were they? What were the things on it? And, you know, I, I literally, when I wrote the book, you can, you know, I write in the book as I, I've stopped and I'm doing this exercise exactly now. And all the things that I, that I wrote down on the paper were exactly what I wrote in the book. I actually did, I almost live streamed writing that, that exercise in the book. And those are my most expensive times. Now, some of them actually do cross over. One or two of those things actually cross over. But one or two things crossing over does not prove that money equals enjoyment. If anything on the list isn't exactly the same, it means that money and enjoyment aren't the same thing. And if you've got like seven things on each list and only one or two are the same and five or six aren't, then money and enjoyment aren't the same things. Mm -hmm. And that to me is like, let's look at that, right? If you can identify that, it already starts to set you down the path. I think the beauty of this is the moment you do that exercise, if you're thinking about how do I optimize my use of money, right? which is the simple path to financial peace of mind is, is optimizing your use of money in so many ways. If you're going to optimize it, what are my happiest times? Which one of those are cheap? Do more of those. Like bang, done. But it already sets you on that path because sometimes it's just like what things really make me happy? I should do more of those. That would optimize my life if I do more of those. That take me down that path. And that to me was exactly what I was looking at with that project. And that's why, you know, you don't get what you pay for. No, you don't, right? If you're trying to buy happiness, you're not going to get it. You're going to end up on the expensive column. And what you want to be is in the happiness column. And that just takes a little bit of thought and remembrance and, and mindfulness. And say, so I'm going to go down that column. Beautiful. And, and, and I, you know, I can listen to you all day by the way, I could just shut up and just let you just talk by the way, for the next 40 minutes. And I would be just fine. That, don't, don't, don't say that. Cause I might do it. <laughs> I could just, matter of fact, uh, matter of fact, I could give you this, I could give you the backside of a cereal box and you could read it for me. And I would listen to you all day. I just love this. Just love listening to your voice. Um, you talk about uh, fear of missing out, uh, which we call FOMO. Right. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you make it really, really clear uh you say while some emotions can be long lasting like love many others are short term period and they will go away all on their own money however stays and by being invested it can grow we can spend it on something forgettable or we can keep it and change our lives and you you say that fomo is a temporary fear mm -hmm. right 
temporary fear of missing out, driving your decision making. Talk to us, get us through the fear of missing out because it's really, it's really again, this concept that we've that psychologists have created in marketing mm -hmm. uh, that has created this thing, and social media has done it too. I mean, we have to admit, mm -hmm. I've written, I've written a lot on social media and the psychology of social media. And the truth of the matter is everybody's promoting a lifestyle. Here I am on my boat. Here I am, in, here I am at this event. Here I am here. Here I am there, right? And so we see the event and we go, oh, I missed out on that. Hmm. Do you, that's the thing. I don't think we do that so much. Mm. Okay. I, I, let's have one moment we disagree with each other slightly. I mean, yeah, no, 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 no. I'm I, I think... We we have it's kind of it's the fear of missing out. It's a it's a future based thing. Mm. The most of the the thought process is, I, I'm going to miss out on this. 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 I'm going to. Then when it happens, is like, uh huh. Next thing. Mm. It's it's really the the real drive. The, the the majority of the fear, the majority of the anxiety is in advance. I mean, we've all not been to parties, right? Sure. Uh, and, and how many uh, how many of them do you really regret not going to? I mean, now I'm in my 50s. I don't regret not going to any. I mean, I'm just like, I'm happy. To... <laughs> I was say the same thing. I don't regret going to any of them, actually. Yeah. It's like, so it's like these days, it's like, you know, and, and yet that to me is, is, and more often than not, like you kind of regret the things you didn't miss out on is more likely. I mean, it's very rare that we actually do, I mean, there are moments in our lives we feel like we didn't do something we could have done, but it's normally more a sense of, I should have achieved that. I should have taken that shot, right? That's the, you know, those are things that longer term is like, I had a chance at this. I didn't do it. it you know, I've got occasions in my life where I didn't take, metaphorically didn't take a shot. And I should have taken a shot. And it's like, yeah, I should have taken that shot. But it's never been, should have bought this, should have gone to that party, should have done, gone on that holiday, should have done this. Those were all, I've forgotten about them immediately, but the, the fear of missing out was building beforehand and then it's just gone and then it's all on to the next thing. That to me is, is a, it, it sort of, you know, um, I'm sorry if I steal something from what you're gonna say earlier on, but again, talking about my age, it, it experience, it's an experience I have more and more these days is, is the, the doorway effect. And I love the doorway effect because it's such a negative in life. You know, with doorway effect is a, from probably like late thirties onwards, it happens and then it happens more and more and more and more is you, you want something in the bedroom, but you're in the living room and you walk into the bedroom to get it. And literally as you walk into the bedroom door, you're like, what the hell did I want? Uh, and you just cannot, and you, 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 you long, it doesn't matter how long you stand in the doorway of the bedroom looking, you cannot remember what it was you want. And, and it's actually, it's a, it's a genuine psychological phenomenon. Because what your mind does is it knows that as you go into a new environment and a room is a new environment, it clears the equivalent we have in our brain of random access memory. It clears your RAM so that it can take in more information because you're going to have to take in more information. You're in a new environment. So as it does that, it blows the thing that you're like, I need the scissors. I need the scissors. And you walk in the room, no idea I needed scissors. right? <laughs> uh, and it's like this using that, we can actually use that to our own advantage now. One of the things we can do is like, it, just get up and move. If you're fit, experiencing some like FOMO, if you're in a shop where you're like, I need to buy this, I need to buy this, I need to buy this, just, just walk through a door. You're, all of that built up cortisol, all of that anxiety, everything you're feeling, a lot of it will get washed out just by the new environment, just by the change of scenery. And it, it's like that, shows you how it's it's just in the present we don't really have we don't have as much regret as we have fomo generally and that's important to balance those two things out and just say look yeah it's not gonna be a big deal yeah that's good that's good i, I yeah I, that's just so good uh you next subtitle i want to talk about is see money directly because you talk about money as a tool hmm. and here's where it, here's where it came here's where it came hard for me where i really went Oh, right. Because we, you know, I've heard that before, you know, money's a tool, money's a tool. But then when you said, you know, you wouldn't give your, you wouldn't give your children a power saw at Christmas. <laughs> and I thought to myself, 
No, I, and you said you, you wouldn't even give him a knife at you know that's just something you wouldn't do. And yet, here money is a tool, and we tend to give it mm-hmm. without explaining how to use it because mm-hmm. we were never explained how to use it. Walk us through money as a tool, given that context, because I think this might help people rethink about when they hear the word money as a tool. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's the most powerful tool. So let's let's identify that word, why it's a tool. Mm-hmm. And it's a tool is anything that helps us do something, right. right? That's That's who we are as humanity. That's a unique animal. We use tools. But money's the only tool that helps us use every other tool. Right. This is how we get most things, non-emotional things into our lives. If I need a power saw, you know, if I need a knife, if I need a TV set, if I need anything, money's the thing that makes that happen. Because and, and this is really, uh, you know, in, in the stage of the book where we talk about what is actually money anyway, it's time and energy. Mm. That's how I get it. I, ha- you know, I have to put my time and energy or creativity, or inspiration, or any other kind of human trait, I have to put it together, package it up, and someone else will buy that from me. That's what, now why is it still that thing when I've got it? Well, that's what I get from other people when I give them my money, you know, even if it's just the straightforward thing like, uh, you know, lunch, right? If I go out and buy lunch somewhere, you know, someone else, if it's a sandwich, someone else has grown that wheat, made that bread, put the things in there, served it up nicely, decided what the color the bag should be it's in. This is lots and lots of other people's mon- time and energy. That's what I'm giving up my money for. That is a tool that enables us to do anything else we want to do with our life. It's a tool. But the point is, are we using it wisely? You know, because if you don't know how to use a tool, you shouldn't even touch the tool. And yet, and you know, this is where, you know, this is where I'm going to pull back on the rant because I can feel it coming. You know, we're in school 12 to 15 years. And we know that when we leave school, we're going to learn to need, we know how to, we've got to know how to read and write. We've got to know how to do some basic numbers. We also have to know how to handle money. We know this. Mm. And yet we're teaching reading and writing. We're teaching some basic numbers. We're not teaching how to handle money. And because we don't know how to handle it, and yet it's all around us, we think we do. Right? So, and to go back to this thing, you know, about you wouldn't give it to your your child at Christmas, but yeah. Here's a hundred dollars from from Gramps, yeah. right? Here's fifty dollars to the other brother. Oh, hold on, who's loved more, right? It's like, whoa, how did we? You know, that's this is insane. Like, this is maybe the other grandparents don't have a hundred dollars, so they only give twenty. Does that mean they they love them less? You're putting these things into, you know, this is money to young kids. It's like this has got to be done under. We've got to think about this. It's got to be done in a very controlled way. And kids have to understand what money actually is. And you start doing things like that. It's like, okay, I've got $100. What am I going to do? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to spend it as quickly as I can because that's what I see everyone else around me doing. And, and that becomes the cycle that kids build into. And it informs in all kinds of ways. And yet no understanding at any point, no education in the idea this is a tool. I mean, I, and I'm sorry if I, you know, because the one thing money really can do, because we touched earlier on that it can't buy happiness, but what it really can do is it is it can buy a ha- happiness on average. Mm. Right? And the beauty of that is it's like, yeah, it's never going to buy you your happiness. But when you're really, you've got a real problem, that's when you get the tool out, right? You want to chop down a tree, you need the power saw, right? If you've got a problem, whether it's your car's broken, whether it's a, a health issue, whether it's you need to fly across the world to see a relative, any of these things, if you don't have the money there and then, you're going to be unhappy. And the money can solve that unhappiness and fix the problem and get you where you need to be, get you to do the thing you need to do. Lack of money can cause a huge amount of unhappiness, and it can fix that. But it cannot buy the immediate happiness that our advertising friends promise us. And that is how we can use it. That's the tool. That's the use of it. The uh, simple use of it. We can come uh, into more complex bits later. Well, yeah, I just, you know what? We, we, we hand out money. I did. You know, I, my grandparents gave me money Christmas when I was a kid, right? The holidays, hmm. birthdays. But they never gave me a user manual, mm-hmm. you know. And I, I kept thinking about your analogy there, and was like, you know, when I, you know, I love working with my hands when I can, and I've I've ran chainsaws before and and cut down trees, but you know what? Somebody trained me how to use it, 
Yeah. You know? They spent time with me saying, you got to do this. You got to put the glasses on. You got to do, we don't do it with money. Yeah. And yet it's, it's, it's more powerful than a chainsaw. Matter mm -hmm. of fact, you couldn't get the chainsaw without money. Yeah. And, and so it's so powerful. And yet we do we, nothing in our educational system prepares us to deal with it. Um, you know what? This would be a perfect time for I jump into the next part of it. You know what, folks? You're listening to Michael Gilmore, who is, by the way, if you don't think he's awesome, he's awesome. Because I'm telling you, you're learning a lot already. The book is entitled Little Book of Zen Money, A Simple Path to Financial Peace of Mind. It's absolutely fabulous. Uh, bookstores near you, Amazon, get it. It's, it's brilliant. You're listening to him here on a new direction. Folks, uh, Epic Physical Therapy, let me just, just send me something. Just tell you something. I'm here. It, they offer the most advanced top of the line equipment, things like the Alter G Anti Gravity Treadmill, the Normatec Compression Sleeves, Game Ready. That's just a few. The trained and certified in the most comprehensive cutting edge treatments. Listen, they, they, they do things like blood flow restriction therapy, dry needling, and cupping. And that's just a few. Look, when you're ready for your Epic Relief, your Epic Recovery, your Epic Results, don't look any further. Go to epicpt.com. That's E P I C P T.com. And Linda Craft Team Realtors, listen, for more than 38 years, her clients uh, return because they have made so many different transitions in their life, but they come back because they say that she's a legend of customer service, right? That's the reason why her first client from 1985 still comes back today, right? So listen, when you're ready to sell, buy your home, regardless of where you live, check out Linda Craft Team first. Just go to lindacraft.com. It's L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T dot com. And we're back here on a new direction uh, with um, my friend. I'm going to call him friend because I think we are friends. Uh, whether he wants to be or not, he's a friend. <laughs> it's, it's called a little, it's called the little book of Zen money: a simple path to financial peace of mind. Uh, and we're 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 we the time is running fast. Uh, I don't know how much we're going to get through, but you know what? Uh, maybe we'll do a part two if he's open to doing that. Um, to to because I don't yeah. think we're going to get to mission. Um, but because I, it's really important that we talk about money management in this chapter, I think, and the simple path. And you say there is a reason it is useful to think of a path leading to financial peace of mind. One step comes after another. Help us understand that. Yeah, it, it's such a it's it's a bizarrely powerful idea. You need to imagine yourself on a path. Uh, and I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to I don't know what pathways are like where you're from jay um i grew up in in the cotswolds in the uk where you know if you imagine like a picture postcard british scene that's the cotswolds uh, and and it's it's an interesting area there there are footpaths there that are hundreds of uh, more than hundreds of years old but because they're just on grass fields you can't actually necessarily see them that well right they're just basically they're where grass has been trodden down a little bit more in one direction and so the grass keeps growing. There's the same amount of grass there. There's no kind of tarmac. There's nothing there. There's just the grass bends a little bit more. If you're at the beginning of the path and you're looking across the field, you just see it. The sun reflects off that grass a little bit differently than it's reflecting off all the grass around it. And you know exactly where you've got to go. It's almost like, like magic. And pathways are, are like this when you're on them. I, I was having a conversation with someone because it, it reminded me, if, you, if you're out in the woods on a, on a kind of moonlit night, somehow paths almost shine in front of you. You know where the path is, and it shines because it's just you just pick up the tiniest bits of light and, and the dust around, the soil around, there's a bit more of it, it shines back. It's almost like a silver glow in front of you. That's the path. Pathways are like that when you're on them. At the moment you come in from the side of any of these paths, if you come in a different gate into that field and you say to someone, there is a path on this field, find it, you come in the wrong way, you cannot see that path. It's just not even there. You just look and go, this is just grass. What are you talking about? There's no pathway here. And this is, this is why it's so important to think about pathways when we think about money. Because too often we come at, we come at money from the side. You know, mm -hmm. money, you know, we're at, it's like you've, 35 years old, you need your first mortgage to buy a house, you've done a bit of saving, but you've never really had any finance classes at all. And all of a sudden, someone's talking to you about the different kinds of insurance you need on that and what kind of, I mean, let's put it this way. Just a year and a half ago, I was discussing a mortgage in the UK. And my mortgage mortgagor asked me, 
do you want a fixed rate or a floating rate interest rate? And I was like, are they offering this, asking this question to everyone? Is everyone in the world having an internal discussion about US Fed rates in, the, in, the, in January 2022, right? Like, not now. Uh, and I was like, because I was. Um, but, you know, I'm a, this is what I do for a living. And I was like, why are you asking this question? Was, oh, it's because it'll help people budget. I was like, oh, okay. Um, it's not about where Fed rates are going. But most people come into the side and these paths look complicated. They don't even see the path. But if you start simply, like let's say you come into a field and you're not 100% sure where that path is. You can't see a path at all. You take a step. What you do is you take a step. The one guaranteed way you will not find the path is not taking a step. You take a step. You take a simple step. You stop and look. You take a step. You stop and look. Where do I need to get to? Where's my next signpost? What do I need to find? You take simple steps forward, small steps. You don't start running if you can't see the direction you've got to go in. Small steps, small steps. Because this is how we build. I mean, in the end, no matter what, you know, no one is running a marathon in one bound. It's small steps, small steps, every single part of the way. Every single runner is doing it that way. And that is what we have to do. And that's what we have to learn is that these small steps are fine. It's not insulting that I need to go back and think about what money really is before I decide I want to become an entrepreneur. It's actually the smart way. Because if you, I, look, I, and I do, I end up in meetings with people who think they're entrepreneurs and, you know, and you realize that they don't really know what money is and how it should be treated and, and how to value it and, and what to do with it because they haven't built those fundamentals. And it happens at all points in the spectrum of, of anyone you talk to about money. But if we go back, we go back and we understand what it is and then we just take simple step, simple step, simple step, then we really understand it, you know, most keenly. It's why I think if you look around, let's say, let's, let's take something I know it's a little bit more sort of it's diversive these days, the uh, divisive rather, the, the fire movement. Mm. You know, because people, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some, people, some, some people love it. Some people hate it. I think it teaches, at its most basic, it teaches some very important basic ideas. But one of the things I love about it is some of the most zealous people in there, these are not people who started out with a lot of money. They're people who started out in debt. Uh, and that's why they saw the importance of this. And if you get out of debt, there's only one way of getting out of debt, small, simple steps. You know, you've got to change your life and you've got to take little steps, little steps, little steps. And once they've taken those little steps, they've gone out of debt and all of it's like, okay, now I just have to keep doing this. If I keep doing this, I end up with financial freedom. So many fire enthusiasts are there because they've come out of debt and they fixed their life in debt and then they've moved ahead because they felt the need to. And that is, I, that's one of the things I find most inspiring about the FIRE movement is actually so many of them come from debt mm. and shift their lives and take these little steps. And once they get to zero, they realize, hold on, not being in debt is nice, but being financially free would be better. I'm going to just keep moving that way. And it also partly explains why they are so zealous and so enthusiastic because right. they've changed their lives and it really worked for them. So they really believe it. Um, but that's one of the things I find fascinating, but they've done it with small steps and they just check one step, one step, one step, one step, one step. And they just keep on going. They build the momentum and they can't even imagine they were back where they were. Uh, and when they were back where they were, they couldn't imagine they were going to get where they are. So, uh, just for the listener and the viewer, it, mm. the fire, fire movement is financial independence, retire early, by mm. the way, that's what that means. F I R E. Uh, and so, and it's a huge movement by the way. If you've not run across the, well, if you've ever run across anybody who is a fire and part of the fire movement, they are very evangelical about it. <laughs> I think there's incredibly zealous uh, about the movement. Uh, financial, in, in, financial independence, retire early uh, folks are incredible. Right. Is that a fair, is that a fair way to describe them? It is. It's because they found, they found the answer, you know, and it works for them, and I think it's great, and I love their enthusiasm. Um, but it's, you know, it's, and you can see bits of of my thinking that are the same as theirs, and, and undoubtedly. But one of the reasons I didn't want to talk about fire is it's so it is so divisive because it's about telling people. Too many of them start telling people what they must do. Right. And I hope you know, while you know, while I'm talking, I, I say these are good ideas. We always start at that beginning point, and that's why it's the first thing in the book. There's no judgment. If you don't do these things, I'm I'm not judging you. Right. If you would like a happier relationship, you could with money, you could move along these lines. These are the kinds of steps you can take. 
But if you don't want to, if you want to spend every dollar you ever get, that, that is your call. But if you don't want to, and if you want a better relationship, you could try these steps. But there's no must. There's no, you must retire early. There's no, oh, you're not saving as much as I am because I'm more zealous than you. None of that. <laughs> so you have, a, you have a subheading here called, how much is too much? Question mark. Uh, oh, what, 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 what do you mean here? How much is too much? What, because I think to the average person, we'll go, well, there's just never enough. Mm. right because we just we want more right you know my, my wife asked i got a bunch of guitars hanging on my wall right my wife asked me the question how many guitars is enough and i said just one more right? <laughs> yeah. I was, right i said just one more right because you can only play one at a time so just one more this will be enough yeah. right help yeah. us understand how much is too much yeah it, it is i mean and and again no judgment right i'm not going to criticize you for having you know, because they're a source of joy. I'm sure that's oh, that's why gosh, you buy them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it, but how much is too much? It there is this chasing of things that are, you know when we're chasing things that don't give us joy, when we're chasing things that are for other people, when we're recognizing that we've thought we would be this would be complete if I have this, and then you realize it's not. You think this thing is going to deliver deliver you joy, and it doesn't. Now, if you're hanging all those guitars on the wall, if you're bringing them out every now and then, and and every time you look at it, yep, actually this does still bring me joy. You know, and this one and this one, they all of these still bring. I'm really glad you used this example because it's so nice to because yes, you can see how each of those things would still do that. But too many of us are buying things that are in the cupboard, right? You know, they're they're just we we're basically they're in the holding pen before we throw them away. And we bought them, we spent a lot of money on them, thinking, this is going to change my life. This is going to be amazing. This is going to do, and it didn't do any of the things. And then, so the next one, please. And the next one, please. And the next one, please. And the, 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 the phrase for this was, uh, was termed, I think, in the 1970s. I'm going to forget the guy's name who, who came up with it, but the hedonic treadmill. Oh, I, but I, it's I, the, I think. Yeah, that's it. Was, it. Was, I think. I think. The, yeah. He, yeah. He, yeah. Hedonic, yeah. It, it's just we have this, and, and it's really important to recognize that it's hedonic. And, that, and the reason I say that is because the little-known hedonic is the, the Greek word for one form of happiness. Like really important to recognize, only one form of happiness. And it is the fleeting happiness we get from those kinds of things. Right, um, and there are, other, there are other forms of happiness that stick around, like the happiness we get from our families, the happiness we get from achieving things. You know, it's like when we actually set our mind on a particular goal that we know is going to be hard and we get to it, that's a happiness that does not go away, right? I mean, we can let it go away. We can convince ourselves we need to chase another goal, but that's also fine because when we're in that mode, we've recognized that chasing the goal makes us as happy as achieving the goal. Mm -hmm. But those kinds of happiness don't go away. Not like going into the store, being convinced you need it, taking it out, walking out the door and going, hold on, did I just buy that? Did I, did, what did I just do? Was that even remotely necessary? That is how much is too much. And it, it just, and it distracts us from everything else we do in life. Yeah. The, the, you know, there's the two, there's hedonia and eudonia, right? Which you just described here. Hedon, hedonic, yeah. hedonic, right? Is a temporary fix, right? It's that temporary yeah. happiness thing where we, we jump from moment to moment, which is what most of us do. The eudonic is mm. where we, you know, the longer term where we go, it's the achieving, it's, it's what we're doing right now, right? There's more of a eudonia having this conversation and, yeah. and having the potential impact on the world. And that when we're done here, we could say, you know, that this was powerful and that's going to mm -hmm. be more lasting. Um, that's, that's what it alters there. Um, we only have a few minutes left. It's gone so fast. Um, it's, but it's been terribly fun. Um, you tell people that they need to ask themselves that question, how much is enough? And then um, you do talk about having people estimate or calculate what enough level of lifestyle would cost you a year. Mm -hmm. And you do have a formula here about spending and multiplying it. And so can you, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that, I mean, that is one of the, this is where I discovered the, when I first saw the fire movement was actually I was trying to calculate that movement, that, that calculation myself. And it's like, you know, okay, when, when does this stop? When am I, you know, because, because I'm an international person, I'm, I'm 
to the acting, so I'm British, I live in Singapore, I've lived in many countries in the world. I don't have a pension system that's gonna take care of me. I, I needed to sort these things out independently. So at one point I'm like, okay, just personally, how much do I need? When am I gonna be able to take care of myself? And I've been thinking about that you know, for quite a while and I was running spreadsheets, what was gonna be, how much do I need in the bank? How much do I need invested? What do I need, where, where do I need it? And I think in about the same couple of weeks, I, I came across um, Mr. Money Mustache, who's one of like the first people in the fire movement. Um, Pete Aidney, I think his real name is. Uh, so given that I'm going by a strange name of $7 millionaire, I'll, I'll give his real name as well. And then, but I actually, at the same time, from, from my work, I, I had a meeting with the investors for the Rockefeller Foundation. And the Rockefeller Foundation, in the meeting, they were giving their basic introduction as to what they do and the, the charitable donations they give. And I said, well, we've been, we've been um, donating money to various causes, 4% of our asset base, um, ever since our foundation, hundred and I think it was 105 years ago. I think, hold on, how can you give away 4% for 105 years, right? You give away 4%. For 25 years, it's all gone. Oh, no, not if it's well invested. I mean, you think, hold on, that's exactly what the people in fire are saying, 4% rule, 4% rule, right? Yep. If you invest it well, it doesn't run out in 25 years. It doesn't run out in 30, 35, 40 years. The Rockefeller Foundation has been spending 4% for more than 100 years. And the amount they can spend every year grows every single year because it's been well invested. I think that's the number. That's it's it. It's the four percent rule. It is the right number. It's twenty five times because the inverse four percent twenty five times. So you can calculate. If I can calculate what that four percent is that I need, let's say whatever it is. Let's say it's twenty thousand dollars. So I need twenty five times that. I need five hundred thousand dollars invested in various forms, and I can take that twenty thousand out. And then let's say if I make a seven percent return, I take four percent. Three percent goes back in. In most years in the last 40, that's been more than inflation. Currently, as we record, it's not more than inflation. But, you know, inflation's heading back towards that way. But if I can make that return, it can cover for inflation. And I can keep taking out. Next year, I can take out, it would be 20,600 would be you know, for inflation. And I can be, my lifestyle can be covered for inflation. Now, that was very powerful for me for two ways. One, okay, that's just, <clears throat> I remember think, seeing that number and I remember thinking, that's one, that's insanely simple, right? I just need 25 times what I spend every year. If I can calculate what that number is, I can calculate 25 times that number. Now, I'm, I, to, to this day, you know, when I talk to people about financial literacy, in the back of my head, that's actual financial literacy. Do I know what it takes to become financially independent? Because if I don't, am I really financially literate? Am I in control? in the way that I am in my reading and my writing and my math, that you know, I can actually do all these things. Because if I can't know exactly what I need to, to, to get out, to be financially free, I'm not really as literate as I want to be. And that's the definition I would put on it. And that's because that's like genuine independence. But the second part of it, I don't know if you, you know, it's, in, it's in the book, so you have seen it. Like that 25 times, mm -hmm. what if that number was zero? What if the bottom number was zero? I'm infinitely happy. What's my annual spending number? What if it was zero? I'm already infinitely wealthy. Now, there are people who live like that. And, and I would love for me, you know, one of my favorite places in the world is in Laos. It's Luang Prabang where the monks walk around every morning and they collect food from the local, the, the local townspeople. And it's been going on for hundreds of years. They need no money. They're infinitely wealthy. And that is, you know, somewhere between fire becoming super wealthy and those monks in Luang Prabang, there is a path and we can become financially independent, which basically financially independent, you cut that number, that's infinitely wealthy. Same thing, because you're doing what you want to do. Beautiful. You know, we've done an hour. It's gone so fast, <laughs> uh, Michael. Um, how, how, how many more have you got? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to have to bring you back for another show if you're open to it. I would love to have you back. Uh, tell people how they get a hold of you. Yeah, I would suggest the easiest way to find me right now is to go to uh, zenmoney.net. So okay. Z-E-N-M-O-N-E-Y.net. Uh, the beautiful thing about that, so it's just about that book. It's not about the other stuff that I do, but there is a section in that book which outlines some of the uh, 21 of the 49 steps that we have in the back of the book. 
So you can actually get a little feel for what those individual steps are like uh, and try them out and see if they work for you. That's awesome. Uh, stay with me. Folks, this is the show. Um, listen, you're in control of three things, your attitude, your effort, and your resiliency, right? I know you're going through tough circumstances, but you can really control those three things. It doesn't matter. You can control your attitude. You can control how excellent you want to be on any given moment. And you know what? Only you can get back up again. Take advantage of it. I'm going to be back next week. It's going to be another great guest. It's going to be another great book. It's going to be another great show. As I say to you all over the world, you had a lot of choices. You chose us. And I appreciate you for doing that. And as I say, ciao, everybody.